us is Pastor Mark Hensley from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church. I want to welcome you uh, today, wherever you're watching, uh, around the country, around the city. So glad you're here. I'm privileged to sit here with two of my favorite people. We have Ashley Boyd, who is our children's director, and Tom Curls, who's our director of music and education. And we have about five or six other folks here. Two of our sons are here and other uh, guests are here. But we're honored that you're here and want to welcome you uh, specifically today. We thought we would just start by talking about what the Lord's been doing uh, this week. And uh, Tom, I'm going to start with you. So what have you observed during these weeks? I know we've all been busier than we've ever been, but what have you ex uh, experienced? Well, there's an energy, there's an uh, intentionality about it, and there's a joy about serving. You know, and seeing the response of the people that are literally shocked that somebody would care enough and love them, you know, and the, the managers that we've talked to have been just so supportive and uh, eager, you know, to kind of respond and contribute, you know, however they can, you know, make sure their people are taken care of. Very good. Yeah. Scary times for sure. And um, obviously the Bible says about our Lord that perfect love casts out all fear. Mm -hmm. And as we go through this, what would you say to folks who are watching, and certainly sometimes we feel the same way, kind of uh, overwhelmed by everything, and maybe feeling fear? What would you say to folks that are feeling that? Jesus is God. God is a God of hope. And uh, the fear that we have, all of us have some kind of fear going on. And God has not given that fear. And I just encourage you to kind of uh, go before your Savior and be able to pray through that fear and just ask him to take it. Ask him to just do what he needs to do in your life, your heart. And uh, it's worked for me, you know. And I uh, just want to encourage you just to lay down some things that maybe need to be laid down, whatever that might be, so that fear would not grip you so much today. And just let him love you. You know, just say, Abba, Father, I need you. Help me through this fear. Excellent. You know, as he was just sharing, I was thinking of a wonderful verse that says that God will supply all of our needs according to his riches That's in right. Christ Jesus. Amen. Not all of our wants, uh, but all of our needs. So along the way, this journey is, is not uh, without uh, challenge, of course. We all feel that. But watch how God will provide for you. And just having this opportunity to speak to you is a great honor. Uh, Tom's going to pray in just a moment, and then he'll go to the piano and play. And then Ashley and I will talk about what she's experienced uh, in these weeks we've uh, served together. So, Tom? It's always a joy to come to the throne of grace and invite countless numbers of people to join that effort. And I just ask that you would just bow your head right now and um, uh, be able to get into a, a posture of prayer. Uh, if you're in a chair or a sofa or a dining room, table or somewhere in the house, just pause a minute as we pray for our pastor and pray for our nation. So Heavenly Father, I just come to you in Jesus' name, that matchless name which is above every name. And we come into your throne of grace and we understand that you will never turn us out when we come into that position and that posture of prayer. And so Lord, today, first of all, we want to pray for our nation that is going through some tough times in our world that we live in as well. Lord, lots of people, lots of first responders, lots of people that have lost their lives, a lot of families hurting, and we just ask for your grace and your mercy and your presence to people in need. And Lord, we all also want to pray for the message this morning with Pastor Mark, and I'm reminded that uh, I'm thankful for my pastor. And I'm thankful, Lord, that you've enabled him and called him to this ministry, and you've equipped him for today's message. And you're in the business, Lord, of giving him the gift of proclamation and preaching. And so, Lord, bless him today with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and help him to be very clear that the word of God uh, be proclaimed in ways that are fresh and new and powerful, Lord, that reaches into the heart and life of every person online listening to this message or just the audio portion. And so, Lord, we want to praise you, Lord. You inhabit the praises of our people and uh, your people. 
So, Lord, we enter into that time of worship now, just briefly this morning, anticipating a word from God. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> it's a blessing to have Tom. He's going to go to the piano now. And while he's playing, I get to talk with Ashley for a moment. So we've had, uh, we've had some challenges, haven't we? And what have you experienced? I know you, you and your husband, Michael, and your sons have, have uh, we've been busy, busy, haven't we? And I want you to share with the folks some of the things you've observed and uh, how people have responded. Absolutely. The first thing I've observed is that this building that we're in right now, the gorgeous and blessed by the Lord, is not the church. It's it's us. We are the church. The people, you guys watching, sitting in your seats, being dedicated, um, whether it be financially or showing up to help the community, like we, we are the church. And I think one of the things that got me with my reflection this morning, my time with God, was just we're not a church that just glosses over what's happening out there. We see the suffering and even more, God sends us resources and volunteers that we're going to help you in every possible way that we can. And that's that's what I've noticed this week. Um, I think it's very important that we find God's light in all of this that's going on. One thing we've been talking about is, is we have resources here. We have a food pantry upstairs that's pretty well stocked. And we even have toilet paper, right? We have toilet paper. So, so we're thrilled about <laughs> sharing that. And if you need anything, I'm talking about the folks locally here in Colorado Springs, just know we care about you. We're thrilled to minister to the community, and uh, we'll continue to do that with uh, sandwiches uh, around the community for the elderly and children that are in need. But I want you to also know how important you are. Uh, we love you. We miss you. These, uh, these empty pews are, are difficult for me to preach to, but I am thinking of you today, and I know you're watching. Friends from around the country, we have people watching right now from Connecticut. Shout out to one of my students, Andrew, and his family that love to watch in Connecticut, and of course, uh, I think Arkansas, Texas, Kansas, Wyoming, the great state of Wyoming, and the wonderful state of Colorado, and wherever you share this. So please share this, because I tell you, God is just moving churches into this new medium, and we're seeing tremendous response. I want you to share with them about uh, an idea the Lord put on your heart with these, right? It's Tell us about these, yeah. So, I'm a children's director with no children. <laughs> um, it is a heartbreaking thing to walk through our beautiful children's wing and just not have noise. I love noise. I'm a big fan of it. I make noise in the office. Yes, she does. <laughs> and this is, there's no kids, and I miss our kids, the ones that are dedicated, and they come, and there's about 20 of them that I just, like, my heart breaks. I miss them so much. So while praying, God was like, well, go see them. Why can't you? And I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. So together, the Lord and I have this idea. We've made little Easter baskets up for them. Each one is specific to the child as I know them. And so in there... I have snuck in our curriculum for the last month that they haven't gotten. And although their smiling faces and their joy is nice, I most miss just their view and perspective from of our God from them. And it's unmatchable. So this week I got to deliver these and hear, Miss Ashley, we missed you. And I cried. They didn't cry because they wanted <laughs> but I definitely did. And I am so, so thankful, one, to have a church that supports us in all of this. And I'm two to have dedicated I know y'all will be back as soon as our doors are open. And I'd like to add to that that uh, if you are a part of the church, your children attend here, and somehow we did not get them a basket, please call the church office tomorrow, 719-597-9004, and this young lady will make sure that they get their basket. And can visit you. Absolutely. <laughs> And uh, thank you for that. Thank you for your ongoing ministry. Thank you to Tom. Uh, thank you to uh, Laura and Ben, uh, who are helping us with technology. Uh, thank you for everyone who is here uh, in the service today. And all of you who are watching, I'm just thrilled to be able to share God's word today. And I want to really encourage you, because uh, I need it, please pray for me that I will speak God's word clearly, articulately, and uh, boldly today. And thank you so much for being a part of this service today. We're honored to have you. I will tell you, though, this coming Wednesday, we'll have our continued study through the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, finishing the chapter 1. Uh, we had, I think, over 300 views for Wednesday. That's awesome. But I want you to know, this coming Friday, Good Friday, why do we call it good when the Lord Jesus suffered so much? Because he paid for us the penalty of our sin, and three days later, 
Like Tony Campolo said, it might be like Friday, but Sunday's coming. Up from the grave he arose. Amen. We're going to have a good Friday service in our home in Fountain at 6.30 p.m. So get some crackers, whatever juice you can find. I'll share a short devotional, and then we will observe the Lord's Supper together this Friday night at 6.30. Our love to you. I'm thrilled to welcome you today. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. You know, if you live a long enough life, you have perspective. You can look back on the bends and the curves of your life and see how the Lord opened doors and how he closed doors. I remember a little boy one time asked me, he said, Pastor, why do you have so much gray in your hair? I said, son, those are wisdom highlights. I don't know if he understood that, but I had pastored for a long time even then. And through time, through experience, we learn that sometimes what we think is a bad thing can be a good thing. Sometimes what we think is a reversal could be something that's positive. I think of uh, when I left a church in Colorado, stepped out on faith, and ended up uh, a few months later being the interim director of missions at Green River, Wyoming. And within a few short months of that opportunity, God opened a privilege for me to pastor the Hilltop Baptist Church in Green River for 10 and a half years. And those memories are very rich to Laura and I. And then God decided to send us back home to where we, uh, we grew up. I married the girl next door to the girl next door. And we actually, Laura and I grew up in the, the very uh, zip code this church is in. So sometimes what we think is a reversal or sometimes what we think is a bad thing can become a good thing and lead to a new beginning. I think of what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago. What he suffered was horrific. It really was. But three days later, he rose from the dead. In my devotional reading this week, I read a quote from Paul David Tripp that I thought I'd like to share with you. Be careful how you make sense of your life. What looks like a disaster may, in fact, be grace. What looks like the end might be the beginning. What looks helpless may be God's instrument to give you real and lasting hope. Your father is committed to taking what seems so bad and turning it into something that is very, very good. The life of the Lord Jesus is a life that is so compelling, we must take his life seriously. I don't know what I would do, quite honestly, with what we're going through these days without a solid foundational relationship with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Today's uh, message from the book of John chapter 19 and verses 6 through 11 will remind us that our soon-to-be-crucified king from John 19 as he was heading to the cross reminds us of two very precious things. He reminds us that... His life is so wonderful, so compelling, so majestic, so marvelous, that we must take an earnest investigation of it. In fact, Jesus will say himself in John 7, 17, if any man or any woman wants to know whether my doctrine is from God, they can know. You can know that Jesus is who he said he was. And his life is worth investigating. I'll tell you something else about his encounter with Pilate in John 19. Jesus will remind us that we are uh, not subjected to the experiences and circumstances of life other than what he allows to be permitted into our lives. In fact, specifically, uh, he is not subject to Pilate's authority, and we are not subject to any authority, but ultimately him as he guides us through life. And we respect authority, certainly. Uh, that's why we don't have services here. We're respecting our government. But at the same time, our authority ultimately is God's son. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So today, we're going to be reading from John chapter 19, continuing a series, looking at Jesus through the eyes of the Apostle John. And today, specifically, Jesus, the soon-to-be-crucified King, John 19, 6 through 11. The folks here, the scant few we have, will stand. We'll have you stand wherever you're watching this right now as we read God's Word. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, 
for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all, unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. As our congregation is being seated, I want you to understand as the 19th chapter of the book of John opens up, our Lord Jesus Christ has already been scourged by Pilate. A terrible instrument called the cat of nine tails had been applied to his back, leaving behind in its wake a torn and bleeding flesh. He had been laughed at and mocked by Roman soldiers. Those men knew how to torture, and they had tortured our Lord. They had pummeled him, they had beat him, they put a crown of thorns down on his head, and they said this, prophesy, they blindfolded him too, prophesy, who has hit you? And they mocked him, they put a robe upon him, a scarlet robe, in some translations it says purple, that is not a contradiction, the Bible never has contradictions that you can't understand if you seek the truth. In our Lord's day, purple and scarlet were different hues of color that were sometimes very similar, and so they would be described as either purple or scarlet. But the Lord Jesus Christ is standing before Pilate, and what he says, first of all, notice, is so important. Uh, our Lord's life deserves a response. He looks to us to respond. And notice in that uh, first slide, knowing the Lord Jesus demands a verdict. So here are the chief priests and the officers, and they see Jesus, and they yell out, crucify him, crucify him. You know what's interesting is they had already decided that he was nothing more than a charlatan. They already decided he was just some uh, fly-by-night uh, Messiah that they could dismiss and not really investigate his life. Uh, they had made a snap judgment of Jesus to their own demise. That's why it's so incredibly important to look at the life of Jesus because it requires from us a response. You can't be neutral. Either you will bow your knee and confess him as Lord and Savior or you will not, but you can't be neutral when it comes to Jesus. And so when you read about it, it's really fascinating. Uh, they had a snap judgment when they saw him. You know, we make snap judgments, don't we? I mean, someone looks at us and they uh, assume something about us. We uh, have people that look at us and sometimes they maybe uh, make a judgment about us. They don't like us. Uh, sometimes uh, we make snap ju judgments. Sometimes we misread people. Now, there are some people who don't misread folks, or they just assume they don't like you, and, and they make it very clear that they don't like you. I mean, in some people, the milk of human kindness has curdled, right? But there's often times when you and I meet people that we make judgments. Our frail humanness, perception felt, is not always perception realized. I read this week, Amy Cuddy is a psychologist at the Harvard Business School, and she's been studying how we make snap judgments when we look at people for 10 years. She and her colleagues have determined that when we make snap judgments about people, we usually assess them under two qualities. We look at someone and we say, can I trust him? Can I trust her? Can I trust them? And then we look at them and we think, are they capable? Do they have something authentic to say into my life. According to her research, 80 to 90 percent of the first impressions that we have about other people have those two questions hanging over them. Can I trust them? And can I respect the person's capabilities? Tragically, the people, many people who were uh, religious leaders who should have known better, assessed Jesus and decided to walk away from him. It is a dangerous thing to walk away from God when he reveals himself to us. We have a moment of decision that we can't ignore. Our Lord Jesus is standing before Pilate, 
Pilate, it's fascinating to me, he had already declared him innocent, but he still had him beaten. He still had him uh, tortured by Roman soldiers. They still mocked him. All that happened prior to this encounter that we're looking at today. What's fascinating about that is, is the Lord Jesus Christ is no mere man. He is God incarnate, the God-man, God in the flesh. And it's fascinating to me how the people then missed him. And sometimes people now miss him. I look at what's going on in our world right now, and it has brought us to a place we never thought we would be. Not able to gather to worship, not able to sit at a restaurant with our friends and look across the table, and not able to socialize, and I, I miss the human contact. I know you do. Uh, we all do. Uh, we will, I don't think we'll ever take for granted again what it is to hug someone or give someone a handshake or be able to lock eyes with them and express love to them. I, I would say to you, during this time of sequestered uh, isolation, that you make the time to connect with your family. Uh, we are blessed to have two of our three sons uh, with us today. And our son's uh, wonderful girlfriend from Peru is here in the service today. And uh, she is an incredible young lady who loves the Lord. And so we're learning about her culture. And she's a wonderful cook, by the way. We're not suffering, I want you to know, in Fountain, Colorado. <laughs> But it's wonderful to be able to just turn off the TV and communicate. And I believe the Lord has given us this time to, to, to consider the most important things of life. Because you realize now what's most important is family and relationships and getting to know one another again. And then not ever forgetting this time. When the sun shines again and we come out of this self-imposed restriction that is mandated by the government for uh, obvious reasons. We will never take for granted again what it is to be together. Right. Tragically, today, many people miss Jesus just as they did back then. They cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate is surprised by that. Alexander McLaren was a great Scottish preacher, was commenting about this. He said, this, some pity may have stirred in the crowd. Meaning when they saw Jesus, some of the people felt... Uh, Pathos felt sorrow for him. Listen what he said. But the priests and their immediate dependents silenced it in the yell of fresh hate at the sight of the prisoners. I want to ask you a question. Have you missed him? You say, Pastor, what do you mean? Have you grown so accustomed to growing up in the church and hearing the message, the, the gospel message of God in Christ coming to this world as a uh, a child born in the womb of a virgin who lived a sinless life, who suffered for uh, three, uh, three, excuse me, served for, as a minister for three years on the earth at the age of 30 to 33, and then was uh, cruelly punished and uh, falsely accused and crucified, and then rose from the dead. Sometimes we get so used to the story that it doesn't have a bite to it anymore. We don't seem moved by it anymore. And that saddens me. I read years ago of a, of a, a girl who was uh, touring uh, Europe with uh, a group from her school, and they ended up in uh, a museum in Europe where they had Beethoven's piano on display, and it was roped off, and uh, they were told not to touch it, but she jumped over the, the rope and started playing some rock and roll on Beethoven's piano. And the curator of the museum, of course, heard what she was playing and rushed to her and said, young lady, what are you doing? She said, well, I'm just playing uh, some rock and roll on this beautiful piano. He said, you know, that was Beethoven's piano. and It didn't move her at, at all. And he said, you'd be interested to know that a world-famous celebrated pianist came by the museum not that long ago. And she said, oh, really? What did he play? He said he didn't play anything. He felt he was not worthy to touch Beethoven's piano. Well, he made his point, didn't he? Sometimes we are so used to the story of Jesus and his love that it doesn't move us anymore. And I challenge you as I challenge myself to not be so familiar with the story that he doesn't drive us to a fresh desire to know him more intimately. Use this time of isolation to seek the face of God is what I would say to you today. Other people are also driven away from him by emotion. Here is Pilate who hears this statement from the Jewish leaders 
that Jesus has claimed to be the Son of God. And the Bible says Pilate was afraid. It moved him in a different way. He was uh, consciously aware that this was no mere man standing in front of him. But with that fear came trepidation. And he stepped away from his encounter with the Lord when he could have stepped into it. And that's a tragedy too. Sometimes people miss Jesus because of their emotions. Or here's what they think. If I give my life to him, my life will become boring. It will become mundane. It will become routine. That has not been my experience. Can I just tell you, listen to me. If I had a thousand lifetimes, I'd give every one of them to the Lord Jesus Christ. I really would. He is wonderful. He changes us. He comforts us. He provides for us. The other night, Ben and I were talking. My son Ben. And he was talking about how blessed... Uh, he and his brother are to be with us right now. And, and, of course, we're blessed to have our sons with us. And I said to him, I said, Ben, everything I have, God has given to me. I mean that. He has given me our home. He's given me my family. He's given me books and somewhere to sit on and somewhere to eat. Everything I have. I am what I am by the grace of God. Right. And we must not forget that sometimes people are hesitant to succumb and submit, I should say, to the Lordship of Christ because they don't want their world to be turned upside down. And they think, if I give him my life, I'll not be able to live my own life. That's not true. You'll live the greatest life you've ever known because you'll have him guiding you every moment, even through the hard times and the harsh times. So we must choose. We must choose. And then you'll notice... Finally, that the Lord Jesus Christ was not subject to Pilate's authority. Uh, he was not subject to Pilate's authority. And that's comforting for me, knowing that ultimately he is our authority. And nothing happens to us without passing through the permissive will of God. Our Lord Jesus was not subject to Pilate's authority. He was not a victim of circumstance. Pilate seems startled. He's astounded. And I want you to hear it like I believe he said it. You will not speak to me. Do you not understand who I am? I'm the one that just had you flogged. I'm the one that let the Romans pummel you. I'm the one that let them blindfold you and slap you around the barracks. I'm the one that did all that to you. And you don't think you need to speak to me. Do you not realize who you're standing in front of? It was arrogance personified. It was an arrogant Roman potentate that thought he had ultimate authority. He's about to find out he has no authority. And that's an important lesson to learn. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus would not speak up to defend himself. He had seen hundreds, maybe thousands of prisoners who would kowtow and bow and tremble in his presence and, and look up through beaten, tearful eyes and say, Oh, please, Pilate, please have mercy on me. Not today. He meets a man, unlike any man he had ever met. A man of hope, of most courage, and valor, and strength. He meets the Lord Jesus Christ, who will not bow down to him, who will not submit to him, who will not be intimidated by him. And I love that about the Lord Jesus Christ. Me, in the Greek text, when he says, you will not speak to me, is very emphatic. Literally, it's a refusal of the Lord to speak to the one who has supreme human authority in an amazed Pilate. Aren't you glad the Lord Jesus stands above every human authority? That's right. Jesus does not speak here. It's fascinating to us. But he doesn't say anything. Before his accusers and judges... He is silent and fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53 verse 7... As a sheep... Before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He entrusted himself. Just like we must entrust ourselves during these perilous days to God's plan for the world and God's plan for us, for you and me, individually. In fact, you know when Jesus was on the cross, the Apostle Peter says that, that Jesus, of course, was surrounded by a multitude that were uh, hurling their insults up at him. Uh, the idea, honestly, in the Greek New Testament is, is violent. They were spewing up their accusations. Can't you come down from the cross? Can't you rescue yourself? Mockery, mockery, while he's hanging on the cross. 
The Bible says, and Peter records it, Jesus entrusted himself to the one who judges rightly. He didn't have to vault himself to a position away from the cross. He endured it because he saw you and he saw me and he saw what we could be in him. No one loves like God and no one showed love like his son. You know what's interesting about all this? In the book of Matthew 27, verse 19, Pilate is interrupted by a courier with a note from his wife. I've learned as a husband of 38 years, when your wife wants to talk to you, this is what you do. Yes? <laughs> yes, ma'am? What, what do you want to say to me? So Pilate gets a note from his own wife. Listen to what the note said. This is fascinating to me. Leave that innocent man alone, she said. She wrote, I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. I picture Pilate's wife tossing and turning in bed and thinking about Jesus. Somehow, someway in a dream, she realizes he's innocent. Don't have anything to do with him. He's an innocent man. But he doesn't listen to his wife. And he doesn't do what he should have done. He condemns him because he's afraid of the Roman aristocrats saying, can you not control your own province, Pilate? Sometimes people won't come to God and won't come to Jesus because they wonder what other people will think. And he doesn't care what his wife said. He just goes ahead. Listen to me. Moments of courage and opportunity are spread out over our lifetimes. We never know when they will come. But come, they will. What if your faith-filled response to this virus is denounced and scoffed at by your neighbors and by your friends? Sometimes people are flippant, and here's what they think. Well, we've always had pandemics. This is going to pass. After all, don't need to worry at all. I, I think that's a dangerous position to take. These are very serious times. Uh, we just went into debt for $2 trillion. Uh, that's $2,000 billion. Our economy is very shaky right now. We're having difficulty getting supplies. If you've been to the stores recently, some of the shelves are empty. These are not easy times. And a pastor will fail you if they tell you it's all going to be okay. We don't know what okay looks like right now. and We don't know what okay will look like in a week or two or a month or two or a year or two. But I feel in my spirit a compelling, passionate desire to say to you, Make sure that you don't turn from Jesus because of what other people think. Don't turn from Jesus because you think if you do follow him, somehow your life will not be as enhanced and opportunistic as it would be if you don't follow him. Just trust him. Research him. Give your life to him afresh. Let him change your life. It's not an easy time to be alive, but in one way it's an exciting time to be alive because I, I sense in my spirit that the Lord could come at any moment. He could. That's right. And I want you to listen to me. Because I don't know, folks, I don't know how long we're going to be able to live stream. Who knows? We have the internet today. I have this moment today. So please listen to me closely. I believe with all my heart that God demonstrated his love towards us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I believe the only way to heaven is through the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. When I was a teenager in North Carolina, I asked Christ to come into my life, and he filled my life with his presence, and I've never known a moment of his absence ever since. And I can, I'm compelling you to take serious these days. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, pray a prayer like this. I trust you, God. I trust your son. I'm committing my life to him, no matter how long it is or how short it is. And I give him my life and my talents and my abilities. And I want him to be the Lord of my life. I challenge you to do that. Because you don't know how much time you have. Will you put your life in Jesus' hands, no matter the pressure to denounce him, or a less serious uh, suggestion by your loved ones to not take it so serious? Will you be serious for him? I believe God has given us this opportunity to be serious for him. Listen to me. Perhaps the greater lesson of all this is how desperately we need him. This virus has reminded us that we should shed our pretense 
and our sense of self-ability and look to the face of God. I was, I've been so distressed, I know you've been distressed, to see how the media has mocked our vice president because he had prayer in the Oval Office. Thank God for people who realize that we must seek God. How arrogant and how haughty we are if we think we can move through this life without God's benevolent provision in his care. And I challenge you to seek the face of God in Christ. I really do. I was uh, thinking this morning when I was looking over the message and wondering what I'd want to say to you about C.S. Lewis. Some of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis. He uh, was an Oxford professor, and he um, was an atheist. He had a good friend, though, named J.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings. And J.R. Tolkien was a Christian. And so they would have these spirited discussions about God and about Jesus. And Tolkien said, why don't you consider... Clive, C.S. Lewis, first name is Clive, why don't you consider that Jesus is who he said he was? And so it began an investigation on his part. What's very interesting is God was drawing C.S. Lewis to himself. In fact, C.S. Lewis' biography is called Surprised by Joy. And in that book, he writes about how spontaneous experiences of joy moved him to consider there must be a greater reality than what I'm perceiving. And Surprised by Joy is the biography of a brilliant Oxford professor, one of the greatest writers in history, who was pursued by God. The Lord Jesus was on C.S. Lewis's trail. Listen to how he explains it. You must picture me alone, he wrote, in a room, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted, even for a second from my work, listen, the steady, unrelenting approach of him who I so earnestly desired not to meet. Isn't that amazing? He's basically saying, the Lord Jesus was pursuing me, and I wanted nothing to do with him, but he was relentless. Listen to what he says. That which I greatly feared had last come upon me, he said. In the school term of 1929, I gave in. I gave in, and I admitted that God was God, and I knelt and I prayed. Perhaps that night the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. His life was changed. In fact, uh, a more expanded uh, aspect of his testimony is he was on his way to a zoo uh, with Tolkien and some friends. He was in the sidecar of a motorcycle going to a zoo in England. And he said, when I got in the motorcycle sidecar, I did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. But by the time I got to the zoo, I believed. How about you? Frightening times, no doubt. Challenging times. Maybe going through emotional duress. Financial reversal. Cupboards are empty. Maybe you're angry at God. Maybe you're wondering, why has he allowed this? Why? I want you to know as a pastor that your questions can be found in intimacy and conversation with Christ. God's Son is real. I believe it with all my heart. I've staked my life on following Him. And my life has been enriched because of that. I challenge you to seek Him out. To begin even tomorrow morning reading through the Gospel of John, written by John the Apostle. Read one chapter a day and say, Jesus, if you're who you say you are, would you show me? And as He reveals Himself to you, Follow his lead. I don't know what happens in the future, folks. I don't. I'm not a prophet or the son of a prophet. I'm a pastor in a church in Colorado Springs. But I know this much. In just a short span of a few weeks, the Lord Jesus has moved the church, and I'm talking about churches that love him all over the world, into a live-streaming medium opportunity that is reaching untold thousands and millions of people. These are epic times, and God's call to you is to trust Him. And if you will, I promise you, on the authority of the Word of God, He will change your life. And you will find what I have found, and the people in this room have found, and many of you who are watching have found. There's no one like Him. He loves you deeply. And on this Sunday, the Sunday before Easter, what a privilege for me to say that to you. I don't want to minimize where we're at. I don't. It's not easy. It's 
It's hard to not see you in these pews. It really is. I miss you very much. But I know you're watching. And I just want you to know you are loved much more than a feeble human pastor could ever love you. You're loved by the grand designer of the universe who spoke the world into existence. And I want you to know he's here and he cares about you. I'd like for you to leave a, a note as you watch this. Tom's going to play for a moment or two. Ben, in a second, will slide the cameras back center platform. Laura has a final slide for you to look at. But when this has concluded and you make your way into the day home to have lunch, please consider who he is, how he loves, and how he cares. Father, I thank you for the privilege to be here today. I thank you for my friends who are in the room, many more friends who are watching around the country. And I pray where there is fear, there will be trust. Where there's apprehension, there will be hope. Where there is a sense of foreboding, there will be a sense of trust. And together, as your people, we will keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And where there's loneliness, God, fill the room with your presence. We pray for our country, our leadership, our president, the vice president, senators in Congress, our wonderful military around the world and here in the States. We pray for our nurses and our doctors and the medical personnel who are just worn out. Thank you for their valor and their courage, and we pray that you to renew their strength. Thank you for the people who still stock the shelves and drive the groceries across the country. And help us to never look at one another as if we don't matter. Help us to love, <clears throat> help us to care, and help us to be a blessing to others and to live out the love and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in these challenging days. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Remember Wednesday night, we'll be in the book of Ephesians chapter one from our home in Fountain. And then Friday, we're gonna have that Good Friday service as we observe the price our Lord paid for our freedom. Have a great rest of the day. And thank you. And share this, please, far and wide with your friends.